Hello, podcasters. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Living History. And thank you for sending in your continued correspondence, questions about history, comments, simply ideas you've had that relate to history and remembrance in Australia. It's really lovely to receive them, so please keep sending them in. And in fact, on future episodes of the podcast, we are going to have panel discussions where we talk about various aspects of history with a group of historians. So I'd love to get your comments and questions for those panel discussions. So please keep sending them in. Go to the Facebook page, send us an email. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, send those questions in, and we'll uh, we'll hopefully get to them and, and answer them in future podcasts. I've also had a lot of correspondence from people lately asking about plans for 2019, telling me they want to visit the battlefields and walk in the footsteps of the Anzacs. And I'll tell you what, it's a wonderful thing to do, and I'd encourage everyone to get out there and visit a battlefield where Australians have fought. It really is a remarkable experience, and I love showing people the battlefields and helping them plan these trips of lifetimes to the battlefields. So at Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours, we've got a couple of very special programs coming up. Firstly, if you want to travel with me, I'm only leading one tour this year in 2018. And that's coming up in October. Depart Sydney on October 12. It's a short one, a four-day trip out into the New South Wales countryside to visit sites associated with World War II in Australia. So I'd love to have you join me on that one. It's nearly full, but there's a few spots left if you want to come along. The highlight of that, apart from going to the War Memorial in Canberra, to the site of the Cowra breakout, the highlight of that is that we're going to the Warbirds Down Under Air Show, one of Australia's greatest air shows at Tamora. So it's going to be a really special four days. So that departs Sydney on October 12. Go to the battlefields.com.au website. If you want to learn more about that trip, I'd love to see you on board. Uh, in addition, if you're planning to go to Europe in 2019, then definitely look at our four-day Western Front Explorer Tour, which visits all the key sites associated with the Australian actions during the First World war we've also got some really exciting tours coming up walking tours of both the western front and gallipoli trips to normandy we've got a whole heap of brand new world war ii tours so 2019 is going to be a fantastic year for visiting the battlefields walking in the footsteps of the anzacs if you haven't done it i'd strongly recommend that you do today's podcast a uh, departure from the military history we've been doing quite a bit of lately. This is a really interesting topic. I recently saw a book that came across my desk called Remembering the Mile Creek Massacre. And the Mile Creek Massacre took place in the 1800s and was when a group of Aboriginal people were slaughtered by white settlers. But it's unique in Australian history just about that the men who committed these terrible crimes were eventually rounded up and brought to justice and several of them were hanged. Some of them served time in jail. It was one of the first times in Australian history when white people had been prosecuted for crimes against Aboriginal people. So it's really interesting. And, and this year is the anniversary of, of that uh, that uh, famous massacre, one of the most important chapters in, in our early colonial history. So I was lucky to speak to a historian by the name of Jane Lydon, who has written a book, co-authored a book called Remembering the Mile Creek Massacre. And it was really fascinating to probe into these dark chapters of Australian history. Look, I'll be honest, it's something we don't like to talk about. We, we don't like to talk about this dark period of colonial history. It's quite controversial, the idea of the frontier wars and the colonial wars against the Aboriginals. It's something that should be discussed. Whether you are in favour of adding more to the knowledge bank of history or if it's something that you are, you are against, it's worth discussing these things. And, and I had a wonderful discussion with Jane about the significance of events such as the Mile Creek Massacre. And her book, Remembering the Mile Creek Massacre, is out now. It's really worth picking up a very interesting chapter of history. So let's hear from Jane now about the Mile Creek Massacre. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was our finest hour. Jane, thank you so much for joining us on Living History. A pleasure. Now, your book, Remembering the Mile Creek Massacre, I've really enjoyed it. It was a very interesting account of, uh, a, you know, an important chapter of Australian history that potentially we don't know enough about. Before we start delving into the book itself, why don't you tell us a little bit about the fascinating work that you've done uh, in previous years up to this point? Because reading your bio, it really is quite interesting, the, the work that you've done. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and, and the work that you've done in this space? Oh, okay, sure. Um, yeah, so I actually worked for, for many years as an archaeologist um, in Australia looking at material evidence for Australian colonial history, but also interaction between white colonists and Aboriginal people. Uh, but then I became increasingly interested in Australian colonial history. And in fact, one of the very first pieces of work I did as a, as a 
um, a postgraduate student, I was employed as a consultant to research an incident that had taken place on Bundjalung country in northern New South Wales, uh, which was a poisoning in um, 1848. So I was just a consultant, I was a student, and I realised that the archives preserve a lot of evidence that has been concealed or overlooked or is unpalatable to us in the present. So I guess I kind of started to develop an interest in these formerly hidden histories quite a long time ago. But gradually, as a student during the 1990s, I, you know, which is a time of revising received knowledge about the Australian past, I gradually broadened that interest and um, became interested in visual sources as a way of writing history. And again, coming back to that theme of cross-cultural exchange between Aboriginal people and white Australia and the legacies that that has left behind and the way that it very strongly shapes so many debates in the present. And then I guess most recently, um, I moved about six years ago now to Western Australia. So um, I now work in a Department of History at the University of Western Australia. And again, building on on these sorts of long-term interests, um, at the moment, I'm um, looking at uh, different aspects of the colonisation of the Swan River Colony, as Perth was called back in 1829. It's wonderful stuff. I mean, the... the history, the Indigenous history, the relationship with white Australians, it's obviously a sensitive subject even even to this day. How important is the historic record? How important is the is understanding how we formed these relationships with Aboriginal people? How is it how important is that to reconciliation today and what we'll see in the future? Yeah, look, that's a great question actually. I think for many Aboriginal people, the documentary record and that kind of formal historical account It's not so important. Um, Maybe, you know, I'm just, there are some Aboriginal people I've heard say, you know, we know these things happen. But I think in a very general sense, we need the evidence. We need that empirical, robust data that that proves, you know, literally forensic evidence that will stand up in a court of law to show that certain things happen that have been hidden um, since that time. So I think for a general audience and for white, you know, mainstream Australia, having that very authoritative historical account that comes from the archives that that, um, that constitutes very strong evidence is really important to create a sense of trust. Because you know what it's like, you know, today we, we live in this sort of post-truth era. Some people call it, you know, the, the era of fake news. And so we're all very conscious of the fact that, that we question narratives and we, we sort of evaluate evidence. And that's where the traditional discipline of history, I think, is really valuable. It shows us that things might have happened 200 years ago, but if we build up a strong argument using um, disciplinary protocols, you know, different ways of making sure that the evidence we use is reliable and that our accounts can stand up to, to challenge and interrogation, then that is a very powerful story that we can use in the present. Well, it brings us neatly to the Mile Creek Massacre because this is probably one of the best known chapters of this very turbulent history, uh, particularly in the in the 19th century between Aboriginal people and white settlers. But I, I wouldn't say that it's one of the most well-known chapters of Australian history in general. It might be the most uh, well-known chapter of the, that whole story of our relationship with Aboriginal people. But it's certainly not something that's prominent when we talk about the history of Australia, is it? No. Well, I think uh, frontier violence is a relatively recent aspect of that history that was really brushed under the carpet until the 1970s. So that's not very lo- that's not a long time ago. And so I think many aspects of that history. Uh, so conflicts, you know, the the struggle for land, for resources, for water, for animals to live off. You know, those very basic questions of survival that were played out over the first decades of white colonisation and conflict with Aboriginal people, I think we're still working to stand. So the work of many dominant in the work of Henry Reynolds and a range of others uh, from that time started to make that Indigenous experience of invasion and dispossession evident to a mainstream audience. But as you say, the, um, Mile Creek, even though we know, many of us know about Mile Creek, that whole chapter is still being disputed. What For those of us who don't know the full story of Mile Creek, why don't you give us your brief uh, summary of, of what actually went on there in, uh, in, in 1838? Yeah, so Mile Creek came at the end of quite a long 
period um, over several months of very intense clashes between uh, armed troopers that had been sent out from Sydney to quell disturbances that were happening inland. So uh, this is uh, the New England region, um, as we call it today. And then uh, after the major nuns campaign had finished, and of course that had entailed a number of quite severe clashes and massacres, a number of local settlers they felt that they had license, I suppose, you know, to, to go out and, and to assault Aboriginal people. So in June 1838, a group of 11 uh, settlers, so this included shepherds, convicts, ex-convicts, led by um, a young free settler called Fleming, rode up onto the Mile Creek Station and they surprised uh, a group of Aboriginal people, Yuri Yuri people, um, mainly women children and a few elderly men and women who were just camping there beside a shepherd's hut. And they rode up and they were fully armed. They galloped up and the Aboriginal people saw them coming. We know this from eyewitness accounts. And they knew immediately what was going to happen. So these sorts of clashes had been going on in their country for months. So they ran into the shepherd's hut to seek shelter. But when the, the horsemen arrived, they dismounted. They forced them to come out. They tied them up with a rope. They tied their hands together and led them, led them off in a, in a line over the hill and out of sight of the shepherd who was the, one of the witnesses to the later trial. Uh, and we know that they then shot and killed. They decapitated many of the people with swords and then um, set fire to their bodies. So uh, they, they, they killed uh, women, children and these elderly men and women. So what, what was perhaps unusual, what was really unique about the Mile Creek Massacre, as opposed to all the other massacres that were happening in that area before and after that one event, was that there were white witnesses who were prepared to stand up in court and give evidence. And there were also white officials, so the lawyers working for the Crown, who were prepared to pursue and prosecute the perpetrators of that of that terrible atrocity. So that's why. Um, so there were two trials. The first trial, these men were were prosecuted and acquitted because, of course, many of the many colonists believed that they shouldn't be they shouldn't be prosecuted for for killing Aboriginal people who were considered barbarians and not fully human. But then, when these men were acquitted, the Attorney General, um, a man called John Hubert Plunkett was outraged and he immediately arraigned them for trial again. And on their second trial, seven of these men were convicted of murder and were hanged. So this is why the, the event is unique, that, that white colonists were prepared to acknowledge the enormity of what had happened and to pursue that through the courts. So I guess Mile Creek is a bit of a landmark because it marks that moment of recognition of Aboriginal humanity and the injustice of, um, of colonisation. That must have been highly unusual for the time for white people to be tried and convicted for these crimes because we're talking nearly 200 years ago. This is a long time ago. This is not recent history. And I think many people would be surprised to learn that that even all that time ago, there was this push for recognition of, uh, of Aboriginal people and, um, and, and more equality in the eyes of the law. Yeah, look, I think we often forget that, actually. We, we often have a very black and white, we have a very simple uh, good and bad version of the past, but many, many people sympathised with Aboriginal people, even debates around colonising Australia during the 1780s. Many people recognised that this would entail great injustice to the Indigenous occupants of the land. Um, of course, that wasn't a majority view, and um, in the end, the uh, colonisers prevailed. But then, of course, every single impact on Aboriginal people was noticed, or, or you know, most of them were noticed, and some people did do their best to either ameliorate or prevent or or, or seek justice and redress for those um, for those um, those impacts. So, for example, um, during the 1830s, Mile Creek came at the end of a decade where what you might call humanitarian sentiment and activism uh, was really at its height back in Britain. So if you think about the history of slavery in Britain, uh, Britain had been a uh, you know, great slave trading empire really for, for, for centuries and had only recently abolished the trade in, in African slaves across the Atlantic. So they passed an act in 1833 that outlawed slavery. So there were a lot of people then who had been very engaged in the anti-slavery movement who turned their attention at that point to the Indigenous peoples around the British Empire. So 
we've, we've tended to forget this. You know, we, we sort of have this very simple view of the past, but actually a lot of people were very concerned about violence and the treatment, the ill treatment of Aboriginal people. And they made quite similar arguments that they'd made about African slaves and they applied these to Australian Aboriginal people. And we see that this is one of the, the kind of um, very interesting historical aspects of the Mile Creek Massacre. Uh, there were people at the time who said, just because they're black, it doesn't mean that they're not as human as we are. And we have to acknowledge that. It's a fascinating chapter of history. And I mean, let's let's talk about the book specifically, because the book approaches it in a very fascinating way. This isn't just a dry account of, of what went on. Tell us about the book, about the structure and, and the inspiration behind uh, behind your book. Oh, well, look, it's so for a start, um, I was just a co-editor with my very esteemed colleague, Lyndall Ryan. So Lyndall Ryan is one of the historians I mentioned earlier who has been instrumental in bringing that forgotten history of Aboriginal responses and, and the impact of colonisation on Aboriginal people to light. She wrote a landmark book about the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, uh, and she has most recently done a huge amount of work investigating the history of massacres across Australia and she's produced what's called a massacre map based at the University of Newcastle that's become a really major historical resource and she continues to work on that. So Lyndall actually um, approached me at a conference a couple of years ago and said, look, we're both working on Mile Creek. You know, would you be interested in, in, in working on this book project? So we then assembled a group of of historians and Aboriginal people, artists, lawyers, who have all contributed to that project. We went and we, we visited the, the Friends of Mile Creek Committee, which does amazing work every year in staging a commemoration of the event at Mile Creek. And of course, that was a very important part of the process. We, Lindsay and I were both aware that unless we talked to the local community and particularly the Aboriginal community, uh, then you know we, we felt that it would be a very one-sided kind of project. So we, we just felt that that was an ethical and intellectual necessity. So we were very privileged in the end that um, Auntie Sue Blacklock, who is a descendant of one of the survivors of the massacre, agreed to write a foreword with, um, with, with her, her collaborator for the book. And we really then started that process of thinking about you know, what, what are the, the current insights into that historical event and particularly what does it, what, what is its significance for us in the present? You know, what, what, is, what are the legacies of that event and its historical context for us now? So, so yeah, that was a couple of years ago. Uh, so it is fantastic to see this group effort, you know, this edited collection finally come out. And of course, we thought it was timely that we'd do that 180 years after to the event itself in 1838. Well, it's a wonderful collection of, of writings from some very esteemed authors. The thing I liked about the book was that it really does ask some essential questions about about the Mile Creek Massacre. And so, I really, I, you know, maybe we could we could delve a little bit further into that now because I, I think one of the, I mean, one of the fundamental questions it asks about the massacre is why all this time later is the Mile Creek Massacre so important to Australia today? Yeah, look, I think that's a great question, actually. So, some, so in putting together the book, some of our questions were historical. So we wanted to show, for example, that it wasn't isolated. There were many, many massacres. So that question, I think, has been disputed in Australia over the last couple of decades. And again, we wanted to bring some evidence to bear, some historical perspective on that question. So I think your question about why is it relevant now? So, of course, it marks this 180th anniversary, but I think we're seeing a time of great debate and self-reflection in Australia. So I tend to think that's a really positive step. Some of these debates are really divisive. You know, race is something that continues to be central to many, many of these debates in Australia. I think the debate about Australia Day, you know, what does that date of the 26th of January, what does that commemorate? Is that something that is relevant to us in the present. I think that's another symptom of this, this self-reflection and the acknowledgement that we have a past that we haven't always that we haven't always accepted or thought about very much. So I, I, both the Mile Creek Massacre is part of that larger pattern of looking inwards and backwards to, to think about the legacies of that past in, in um, reflecting on Australian identity and Australian values in the present. We touched on this at the at the top of the interview uh, more broadly, but does 
Mile Creek itself, that event that took place 180 years ago, does it play a role in how we see our relationship with Aboriginal people and the bigger picture of reconciliation in general? Are, are, are incidences like the Mile Creek Massacre important as part of that story? I think they're really important, yeah. And so this is what's so amazing about Mile Creek, I think, as well in the present. Perhaps building on that that historical uniqueness as um, as well. The fact that it was recognised in the past has meant that uh, for the Aboriginal community in the present, it's able to, it's done this extraordinary thing. This is a grassroots movement that has come out of the local community in staging a commemoration every year where black, where Aboriginal people, where white Australians come together and very self-consciously and very explicitly declare their uh, forgiveness of one another. So I think that descendants of some of the perpetrators first met with the descendants of the survivors. They asked for their forgiveness. They were forgiven. And there's this very clear assertion of a desire to heal and move on. And in fact, I think one of my favourite quotations is from Auntie Sue Blacklock, who said, we quote this in our introduction, she said, and it just makes me feel light. She said, she said something like, I have no more heaviness on my soul. So some people that might sound very touchy-feely or, you know, it's a kind of very spiritual thing to say. But I think also in a very practical sense, Australia has this need to reconcile with its Indigenous people. You know, so many people have argued that we need to listen to Aboriginal Australia and acknowledge the past before we can move on. So, you know, Mark McKenna, for example, has recently said that this is a really crucial step before we can even talk about, you know, a republic or these, you know, a, a real sense of independent Australian identity. We have the Uluru Statement from the Heart calling for recognition of Australian, of Aboriginal Australia. So I think a lot of these larger kinds of national aspirations rely on these grassroots events and, and the goodwill of people in local communities. So I think this is where the Mile Creek Memorial and its annual commemoration is really leading the way. You know, it's showing us how people of goodwill, black and white, can come together in this, this very forward-looking kind of process. You mentioned the annual commemorations that Aboriginal people hold, that white Australians hold. How do Aboriginal people look back on these very dark chapters of, of their history? How do they look back on Mile Creek and other atrocities uh, very much like it? Yeah, look, as a white Australian, I guess I'm not necessarily qualified to, to sort of speak for Aboriginal people. I'm aware that, you know, listening to, to many different Aboriginal people, there is a diversity of views. Uh, so, for example, one of the contributors to our book was the very famous, internationally famous artist, Brooke Andrew, uh, who's been leading um, a project and as an Aboriginal person to develop an idea about a national commemoration of frontier violence and these kinds of massacres. So I think Brooke takes a very international view. He's done a huge amount of research. He's travelled around the world to look at these kinds of memorials. So he has very sophisticated ideas about what form that might take. Other key Aboriginal people like John Mundine, Again, very famous Aboriginal curator who who curated um, a memorial exhibition at the the, um, the National Gallery of Australia many years ago has has also developed these sorts of artworks that that commemorate um, the Indigenous perspective on on these sorts of massacres. Other Aboriginal people I've I've listened to they I think they acknowledge that many white people want to seek forgiveness, I suppose, or they want to acknowledge what's happened in the past and they, they have a lot of goodwill. There's a lot of goodwill around that and they too want to sort of heal and move on. And of course, some Aboriginal people are very angry because they want people to acknowledge what happened to their families and the, the ongoing impact of that for Aboriginal culture in the present. So I think there's a diversity of views actually out there in, in different Aboriginal communities. And uh, as a white scholar, that's an academic working in this area, uh, I, I think it's important to listen to Aboriginal people and, and to try and acknowledge you know, what those different views are. And I feel very privileged to work with very constructive projects you know, like, like the one led by Brooke Andrew. Well, the book itself touches on a lot of those points. The book covers the, the story, the history, the, the relevance of Mile Creek from a number of different angles. Was there, I mean, I, I, I'm not asking you to choose favourites here amongst the, uh, the chapters of the book, but were there, were there one or two chapters that really stood out for you as, as telling a new story or really shedding light on the importance of this event? 
<laughs> that is really hard. Um, so I would say the book could be divided into two very sort of broad approaches and one would be historical. So the first few, the first chapters, the first half of the book really tries to untangle what happened and to show things like the class aspect of it. So uh, in terms of prosecuting the perpetrators, we know that the ringleader who was relatively privileged and came from this elite part of uh, colonial society basically got away with it. He ran away, uh, he sort of fell out of the historical record and Patsy Witherkin's chapter shows that he lived the rest of his life quite happily, you know, in obscurity out in the backwoods. So he got off scot-free, really, and that's because of his class background. As I've mentioned, we now know that there was this international anti-slavery context, so the humanitarians who really did care about what happened to the Aboriginal people, that was also an important factor. Again, Lyndall Ryan's historical research has shown that Mile Creek was unique in terms of white society's acknowledgement of the event, but it was not unique at all in terms of what happened to Aboriginal people. Horrible things happened to Aboriginal people for many months and years around that one event. But then moving on to the other part of the book, which is about what it means to us now in the present, I think a couple of the key chapters, John Maynard is a very uh, well-known Aboriginal historian based at the University of Newcastle. He's a Warramai man and he wrote a chapter reflecting on Aboriginal soldiers' involvement in Australian conflicts throughout our national history. So he, he's talked about this, again, recently uncovered history of Aboriginal soldiers' participation in wars um, on behalf, fighting on behalf of Australia. And he brings that into conversation, I suppose, with Aborigin the earlier attempts by Aboriginal warriors to defend their country and their territory when they were in ter when they were originally invaded uh, by by white colonists. So I think that's that's a very powerful indigenous perspective yes. that that says that Aboriginal people have always been fighting for their land and their families and their country and the meaning of that has changed over time. But again, you know, he's he's calling for that acknowledgement. And he writes in a very personal way. He he was actually asked to give the annual commemorative address a few years ago. And so he talks about what that was like to drive down to Mile Creek to speak at that event and how he felt about it. So I think that's a very powerful contribution. And then I'd probably also just mention the final chapter, the final contribution to the collection, which is by the, the lawyer, Mark Tedeschi. And again, Mark was invited to give the annual address last year, 2017. And he was... A, I don't know whether you'd say he was controversial, but it, it was quite a surprising talk because he drew a link between Mile Creek and the prosecution by the Attorney General Plunkett and his determination to pursue the perpetrators and to achieve justice for Aboriginal people. He compared that with the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II and he said that even though we didn't have that definition of a war crime back in 1838, he argues that actually the way that Plunkett prosecuted these perpetrators could be likened to that uh, pursuit of justice and the way that, um, that genocide of Jewish people was considered to be a crime against humanity. So I think that's a really interesting analogy. He's saying that this is actually part of, that the, the Mile Creek Massacre was actually part of a process of colonial genocide and the, mild, the prosecution of the perpetrators is a sort of an Australian colonial Nuremberg trial. So I don't know whether everyone would agree with that, but I think that that's a really interesting insight into how we might reflect on the significance of Mile Creek today uh, and its legacies in the present. Well, I think that's what I enjoyed most about the book, and it's something I've seen in a number of books recently, is this idea of collaborative history, a, a, a number of historians contributing to a specific topic. And it's just, it's it's wonderful the range of opinions, the range of views you get, and the different perspectives you get on what we think is a carved in stone chapter of history. And that's something that really, I thought, came out uh, just about on every page of your book. I'm so delighted to hear that. So much work goes into editing and uh, bringing together people like this. So it's really fantastic to hear that. And I hope a lot of other people share that share that um, that view as well. <laughs> I'm sure they will, Jane. I mean, what uh, what do you think Mile Creek holds for the future? How will we look back and remember Mile Creek as we go along? I mean, I'm asking you to look at your crystal ball here, but but do you think Mile Creek will remain <laughs> important as we as we move forward uh, in the coming decades? 
Yeah, I do. So I think that there are a number of things about it um, that, that have made it this national memorial that, that's really leading the way. So I think the fact that it's really emerged from the local community, it hasn't been imposed by the government, you know, in that kind of top-down way, but it's really come out of the local community's desire to remember and reflect and, and re- reconcile with each other. I think that's that's absolutely leading the way. And I guess if I could reflect on the future and the future I'd like to see, it would be to see that happening everywhere across Australia. Um, you know, I, 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 so I live in Western Australia, same, very similar process of, of historical conflict, but also the same goodwill in the present and communities who want to understand what happened in the past and to acknowledge that and to move on into the, into the future on a basis of mutual respect and acknowledgement. So I'd like to see these sorts of commemorations across Australia, you know, happening everywhere to acknowledge these these terrible events in the past, but also as a kind of warning to us and, and a landmark to us in the present as well. Well, very well said, Jane. I mean, I think I think your book does a lot to keep us moving down that path because I think it was a really enjoyable read. And I hope it's it's part of a trend to reveal more about this chapter of history that we don't know enough about. And not just the bad incidents as well, but the, you know, the, the good things as well that went on during this time and the, you know, the, what, what is a very complicated uh, part of history. So I'm glad to see the good work like yours is, is happening now. It's been really wonderful to talk to you about the book. Um, the book is called Remembering the Mile Creek Massacre. It's available now Australia-wide. And Jane, thank you so much for your time. Look, thank you. It's been really great to talk to you about it. Really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. 